I teach urban geography. And uh, I am an urban geographer by training, by discipline. Uh, my work about capitalism is like how it's done. And all these resistance strategies in the city, how they change our perceptions of scale. It's really cool, but it's a PhD. So it's like you fall out of love with it. So I love doing these. Um, so today we're talking about urban art and urban experience. I'm going to frame this in the context of visualities, right? Because we're going to be talking about a lot of different mediums. When I teach this class um, to my undergrads, we kind of get stuck on certain kinds of forms of art, or it gets really, really, really expansive, and there it becomes like a freshman dorm conversation about like, what is art really? And like, we'll do that a little bit here, but we're like older, so we're gonna keep it moving. Okay, so first, does anyone know what this image is or where it's from? This is gonna be a fun little trivia, huh? You can shout it. Not Museum of American Indian, but you're warm because it's a museum. <laughs> <laughs> Not the mat, warm still, because it's a museum. No. I'll tell you at the end. That'll be a fun little treat. OK, or I'll tell you when it comes, becomes relevant again. OK, so our little convo today. First of all, thank you for yeah coming out on a holiday weekend. I'm wearing white right before we can't anymore, allegedly. I watch Queer Eye. Um, so today, we'll talk about art. And we'll kind of contextualize a little bit. So we'll talk about aesthetics, what makes art cool or pretty or whatever, and then kind of segue into art and urbanism. So talking about the political economy of art just briefly, we're thinking about the capitalization and marketization of art here. And then we'll move into urban visualities, OK? So this is where we get expansive with the form. And there are several kinds of themes that we could talk about with urban visualities. I chose as nationalism and as public memory, OK? But there's a lot. But nationalism is a fun one, because these are dangerous times. So for you all, we're going to just shout this out or popcorn this. What is the purpose of urban art? And what does urban art do? So again, when I teach this, a lot of the responses that I get from my students when we talk about a piece of art or uh, art in public space uh, will make these kind of cavalier judgments, like, oh, that's not art, or that's art, but it's bad art, et cetera. And aside from just like matter of opinion and subjectivity, those statements kind of tip their hand to a belief about what urban art is supposed to be doing. Like, there's some sort of yardstick that we're using to measure urban art here, but we're not necessarily being transparent about what that yardstick is. So to kind of get at that question, this is why I'm asking, what is its purpose? What is it supposed to do that you say it does or does not live up to? I'll say that way. That makes sense? Let's do. OK, ideas. What is the purpose of urban art, guys? Yes. To reclaim or take ownership of space. To reclaim or take ownership of space. Yes, good geography tie-in. Job. OK. Other things? Yeah. Um, to share an idea where people see it. To share an idea where people see it. Yes. Yes. Because I feel like the city is trying to support artists. Mm -hmm. So to emphasize the city support of artists, right? So maybe it's not even necessarily about the piece itself, but how prolific artwork is in the city, for example. OK, that's a statement in and of itself. All right, so then segue. What does urban art do then? What does it do in general, maybe like in general in the city? Or what does it do for the viewer? What does it do for you? OK, take that at any scale. but. Different than what the purpose is, what does it actually achieve? What does it elicit? Yeah. Be like gathering or, you know, uh, people going to just, you know, hang out around it and, you know, uh, talk about it, mm -hmm. conversation maybe. Mm -hmm. So gathering, uh, generating a conversation, a kind of bringing together of the public, we'll say. Okay. Yeah. Reminder. Huh? Reminder. Reminder? Interesting. I like that one. A reminder, yes. Like create an identity. Create an identity? How so? Uh, in terms of reflecting like, the collective uh, community mm -hmm. in the city. Mm -hmm. So a collective identity, some sort of polis. All right. Yes, and then you, yeah. No, I guess I'm taking stack. You got it. Uh, 
I'm sorry. Okay. Wait. Produces an interruption of it. Aha. Uh-huh. So it breaks up the monotony. So there's a temporal interruption, right? Temporal flow. Is that what you said? Great. Again, geography and space and time. This is fun. All right. Yes. Aha, uh-huh. points back to history or a particular version of that history. Right. Yes. Yeah. Provokes dialogue about different interpretations. Mm-hmm. Provokes a dialogue. Perfect. You're all correct. Great. So many different uh, definitions about what urban art does. The one that we are sticking with, the one that I find exciting, and the one that urban geographers often focus on, is art as a historical process. So in the same way that we think of uh, academia, the or like a particular academic canon, um, or like even libraries, you know, things that chart the development of thought and sort of human progress, public art does that as well. The fun thing about public art is that it's in a, it's obviously more visceral and it's in constant, uh, you know, contention. And literature is as well, but that's not obvious to us when we're like entering a discipline, let's say, right? You have to then do your own research and find it. It's not fun. It takes you maybe six years um, <laughs> to figure that out. But Art and urban art is a historical project. Okay, we're fixing histories in place here. That doesn't mean that those histories aren't contested, right? But the point is, it's making a kind of historical argument there. And then attempts to produce a particular reality, which is what one of you said around here. Um, so in geography, in urban geography, uh, we don't take anything that's built or in the built environment for granted. Um, you know, we have geographers like uh, David Harvey, for example, who talk about buildings and urban development as not just the physical or the material thing that is put up, but all the political and social processes that allowed that thing to go up and all of the reactions to that thereafter, right? So it's not just about the building, it's not just about the piece of art, but it's the conditions under which that building or that piece of art were made, okay? So then the other part of that is the reality that's produced out of that, okay? So it may seem like really wooey, but we often talk about like, how does that building like make you feel? How, what are the impressions you get of the financial district versus the impressions you get of the East Village, right? These are different things, right? It creates a kind of identity for the people that live there, identity for the people that visit there, and experience as you're walking through it, okay? So we cover all of those topics. So then the next thing to like reduce that further is to say that memory is material. So we're going to be talking about memory at certain parts of this discussion um, because history and memory are, you know, buddies. Um, And we kind of know this intuitively, right? So it's memory is not just something you experience in your brain, but it is something that you hold, something that is tangible. So then we think of the intent and the, you know, implications of urban art or something at an urban scale. So this is a form of a public memory, right? So far? So good? Right. Sorry. It's like in my professor space. I'm like, okay, is everyone with me? Right. Any questions? Let's move on. All right. Perfect. So we're going to move to aesthetics. So another fun group activity. Look at this painting. Right. Uh, Tell me, what kind of work is this? If you were to like classify it, and you can be very particular if you like to have an art history degree, and that's fun. Is it impressionist? Is it modernist? So it's, no, it's not either of those things. I know that, but okay. What kind of art is this? You could be very basic. Is it a sculpture? No. Huh? It is, meaning is open to interpretation, but I mean like in terms of form and like medium. What am I looking at? Scratchy things. I'm really basic here. I'm just like, is it music? No, is it? Okay, what is it? It's a painting. Right, you got it, it's painting, maybe acrylic. I think given these kind of brush marks, it is oil, for instance. Okay, so (laughs) you guys, I'm sorry. I studied art at Sarah Lawrence College, thank you. (laughs) I am advanced. So, (laughs) okay, so it's a painting. All right, so where would you see a painting like this? Elementary school? 
Bushwick. See, listen, you guys feel comfortable. When I just my students, they go in, all right? <laughs> so Bushwick or a school. Um, any institutions? Maybe one that focuses on modern art? <laughs> huh? Whitney. Whitney. OK, you just didn't want to take the moment one. You're like, I'm going to say Whitney. <laughs> all right, all right, it's fine. OK, so maybe we'd see it there. And uh, OK, well, why would we see it there? Why would we see it at the Whitney, or why would we see it at MoMA, or I don't know, any other places? Some curator called it important. Some curator called it important. So we're talking about the marketization, capitalization of it. OK. Why else? Huh? Non it's non-representational. Right. So it's not uh, what we call like painterly here, right? It's not supposed to represent some particular thing. OK, so then why don't we talk about the conditions under which this art was made? Um, it's like a little tricky. So we can think of what, <laughs> without being too salty, what kind of person <laughs> makes this art? Let's say, like, is this someone that uh, has been making art all their life? Is this someone that makes a lot of money making these kind of art? this kind of art? Is this someone that's like a new artist? Is this someone that does art on the side? Whatever. Someone that could have afford to do art on the side and still make a killing off of that art? What kind of person? You don't have to be like rude, rude, but yeah. Probably someone who knows a lot about art already. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, that's what I'm kind of getting at. Like, someone that knows a lot about art already, not, uh, they're not a newbie here. There, it's, there's an explicit kind of choice here, okay, that's being made, right? They're choosing to make that painting. So they have an awareness of the overall, like, art market, right? Um, and they maybe have a working knowledge about, like, abstract art and, like, the, the canon or the conversation of which they're working within, maybe. Okay, any other things? OK. So my point here is that aesthetics, what we determine is aesthetically pleasing or not, is completely mediated through all of these factors of what kind of work is it? Sculptural, music, dance, painting, right? So what kind of work? It's mediated by where we most commonly associate that art to be. Do we associate it to be in like Jay-Z's kitchen when he's telling <laughs> Blue Ivy to lean on that Basquiat? Do you remember that song? OK. All right. A little hip-hop history for you guys from the last album. Um, OK. So uh, or do we see it in the museum? Right. It's uh, the way that we look at art and any art that looks like that art that we would see in a museum you know, influences our opinion on it. And then the conditions under which that art was made, OK? So there are so many farces of art, like going to a gallery, and it's like, this artist made this painting mixing oil with his tears, right? <laughs> or something like that, like, you know, like gimmicky kind of things. So even if we don't know any of those things for sure, they still influence the way that we look at art. So it's kind of a two sides of a coin, though, because when you do know those things, that also mediates how we think of this art if we think of it as good or not. For instance, this is the artist. Right, so this is Marla Olmsted. She's like definitely 18 by now, but and every once in a while when I give this lecture, I'm like, is she here? Um, <laughs> I'm just like worried. I have stress dreams. Like, that's me, bitch. This is my art. Uh, anyway, so she was about four or five when she made that last painting. And it's kind of this <laughs> tricky situation because is the case that she's extremely talented for her age and can participate in a conversation and knows a lot about the art that's going on in some way, right? Is she a prodigy here? Or is it she makes moderately good art, but it's made like like exceptional because she's so young? Like, are we, when we buy this painting, buying the novelty of a child artist, right? Okay, yeah. Right, exactly. Yes, so it's like, well, I had her, like, 
Impressions of an Elephant number four or whatever. Like, I have no idea how they title this. Anyway, there is a really great documentary. I think it's still on Netflix about her called My Kid Could Do That. And it gets into some really tricky territory because they're, <laughs> they were suspecting the parents of actually making some of it. It's like crazy. Anyway, watch it. Um, aesthetics. So... Graffiti is like an easy example to have the aesthetics conversation with because it varies obviously in form and our opinions on it vary in a way that tends to favor formality. So what I mean is this image is from a neighborhood this is around 2010, a neighborhood in Sao Paulo called Villa Madalena, and it's a well-known kind of touristed uh, graffiti neighborhood, but it's not bad graffiti, it's cool graffiti, it's like Instagram graffiti, okay? So the thing, the kind of public agreement in Villa Madalena is that people can graffiti and put like public art anywhere, especially like on private homes, as long as the homeowner kind of approves of your idea. So there's already this kind of formal mediating process here. And I like this picture that I took because we have sort of two forms going on. We have something that's really painterly. This, admittedly, this isn't like graffiti per se, this is. But we have something really painterly. And then we have what we would associate as like tagging in the US. It's called pichasau in Portuguese. And pichasau is really, really classed meaning people's opinions of it. <laughs> when I was doing interviews, <laughs> they would say like, that's for like white trash people. Okay, that's the thing that they do. And partly this is because uh, it's not like necessarily like gang affiliated in the way that people associate tagging to be in the States, but it is definitely like class associated and it appears usually in the Southeast parts of the city. So places that have been, uh, or parts of that city that have been abandoned, tall buildings, people, tag those places that do Pisha Sao to make claims over that space. Not necessarily like violent or like scary claims, but it's almost like I cannot believe they got their thing that high kind of thing, right? So for it to appear in this really formal space is really interesting here. And it'll probably be like painted over okay, um, and put with something like prettier. So then we go to your homeboy Banksy up here. I don't know if he's your homeboy or not. but. It's another kind of formalization of something that was thought of as informal, so like stencil work, okay? And stencil work has a great history. I had only been, like prior to knowing about Banksy, I was only ever exposed to stencil work as it came to like protests, right? So to use that kind of countercultural medium and then make it kind of twee, right? Like it's the guy throwing the flowers instead of a bomb. We all know that one, you know? It's like, like I don't know, other things. So he uses the kind of work of stencil work and also making them cameos. So like the Victorian era kinds of artwork here um, to almost, I don't want to say sanitize his work. I never knew if there was a deep radical edge to Banksy, but interesting. So then we move on to Hanksy. This was in Soho. Did anyone ever see that one? Yeah. So it's Trump is the pile of shit that he is. Um, on a wall, and this is really painterly because now we have shadow, okay? There's some shadow on that shit, right? <laughs> so now we have that, but it's funny because this one's like super painterly and it was really like Instagram famous, but it got painted over. And then what I liked is that when it got painted over, the artist came back and did like a born date, death date and left flowers there. So that became part of the work as well, okay? So point is, what we know about the artist or don't know, and also the level of kind of formality here, or what we interpret as formality, or its proximity to being painterly, informs whether or not we consider it art to begin with, and whether or not it belongs in public space. Okay, so be super impressed because I did my own independent research. So 311 is a trove of data, and all of it is on um, nycopendata.com. You can get any spreadsheet you want. So I pulled some graffiti complaints data from 311. So these are complaints that go to the Department of Sanitation, or they're routed to the Department of Sanitation to clean up, clean up graffiti. Brooklyn has the highest amount of complaints. Make of that what you will. 
Okay, and in 2016, there was uh, 5,571 individual complaints of graffiti. So people calling in and saying, someone has graffiti this area, clean it up. I am a taxpayer. I don't know. They might not have a fancy accent. Okay, so in this map we have these hexagons are not like, it's not 5,500 because that crashed my computer definitely, so you had to aggregate it. But darker ind areas indicate where we had more calls. And it could be several people calling about the same thing. They're all individually logged. Um, so where do we see darker areas? Okay, purple. Where is the purple? Green point. Sunset Park. Bushwick Williamsburg. Very good. Yeah, mainly. So putting this in GIS. Um, <laughs> so the three uh, high, uh, community boards with the highest amount of complaints are, and community boards, I do not make those boundaries. I thought they were very silly and arbitrary, like bed sites com shaped completely weirdly to me. But so the one with the highest amount of complaints with Greenpoint and East Williamsburg with 1,000. Right? So just knock off a thousand of that 5,000 number already. It is just coming from this relatively small area. The second one is actually Sunset Park and Windsor Terrace. But notice the drop off between 1,000 and 586, right? And then the third is bed -Stuy, And then they were trying to play with me and do that like Stuyvesant Heights. And I was just like, I'm deleting this. I don't know if that's like real. <laughs> bed -Stuy, um, and fancy real estate bed -Stuy are there. So. I pulled some like really rough demographic data. This is real back of the envelope research. I do not condone this as like something like published. Don't do this. But I wanted to go through some of the demographics to show how diverse these areas are where they but all somehow see graffiti as a problem, right? So in our highest district, we have a majority white area with 63% and we have a it's sad that they consider this relatively low, but a low rent burden, which means 39% of people uh, spend a third or more of their annual income on rent, okay? And then a low poverty rate, which is at 17%. The borough average is 21, for reference, okay? So then we move to Sunset Park, all the way down here. Majority Hispanic, 2%, but what is the thing about, why is that kind of a false indicator of a majority here, of 42? Hmm? It's a plurality, not a majority. Exactly. It's a plurality, not a majority. If it was something like 63 or something like 80, then we'd be like, all right, there's a lot of these kind of people here. But it's not. It's actually representing a lot more diversity, at least relative to Greenpoint and East Williamsburg. Okay? So 42%. Higher rent burden, though. 51%. So over half of the people spend a third or more of their annual income on rent. And a higher poverty rate. It's 28%. So it's almost a third. And it's 7% higher than the borough average. Okay, so this is a very interesting story of what's going on in this neighborhood. And the third is bed -Stuy. We have a majority black population at 55%. I would still kind of encase that within plurality, even though we have a slight majority here. The rent burden falls in the middle of these two at 46, and a higher poverty rate at 24, right? And the average is 21. Okay, so the point is, we might associate certain people calling their you know, local departments to clean up things with a particular demographic or in income or whatever. But it's actually pretty mixed. We don't know who made these calls, right? We do know that these three areas have really changed in terms of property value and in terms of zoning, right? The calling in of the graffiti is actually more of a hangover from Broken Windows era policing, which is like you have to be responsible individualized citizens and call in when you see litter and all these things. And like, you know, street cleaning and street enforcement and community policing will alleviate all these other social ills. It's more of a reflection of that than it necessarily is about who thinks art is cool. As a joke, I was, refer I was talking to my students about this and I was like, like who here would call the graffiti like police? And someone's like, my dad would. <laughs> And I was like, sorry, your dad's a cop. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to get fired from Oleo. <laughs> okay. Um, takes another sip. So, okay. So I'm referring to uh, Karen Till's work here. She's a geographer, and she does a lot of great... Um, not necessarily like urban art focused work. She focuses on statuary and stadiums, stadia, and other things like large sporting events. 
But she uses this really poetic term of places of memory. Um, so instead of calling them visualities or urban art, they're places that we go to to remember something. Right? And she says they're more than just these monumental stages or sites of important national events. They also constitute historical meanings, social relationships, which is what we've kind of been emphasizing here, and power relationships, right? So I am making a claim over space by putting up a kind of artwork in that space. And I am also making a claim over space by criminalizing it, right? Cool. So transitioning into the political economy and the urban form. I want to just spend a little bit of time talking about the, these conditions under which art is made, or s at least uh, certain kinds of public art. Okay, so we have the more, I don't know, guerrilla or like rogue form, right? The purely like democratic forms of art, you and I like wheat pasting something together. And then we have like state-sponsored art projects or like projects from the Public Art Fund or something like these large nonprofits and things like that. So at least in the United States, um, yeah, yeah, I'm going to include the West here. So the kind of mode of artistic production in the formal sense, meaning where governments and like the nation state was spending its money and its focus, shifts largely from Western Europe to the United States post-World War II. Why would that happen? What's going on in Western Europe post-World War II? Describe the scene for me. <laughs> this goes back to like civics, like Marshall Plan shit. They're like, it's not good. There's not a lot of capital there, right? So the art world moves over here and we create our districts and we have this entire system and the state actually invests more and more time into this project. Uh, in the 1960s, we have the formation of the National Endowment of the Arts, right? So what does the NEA do as a federal organization? It's an endowment for the arts. What happens? They pay artists. Exactly. <laughs> Basically, they pay artists. And if you think about it, they subsidize the production for a certain amount of years, since the 1960s, right? And that support has ebbed and flowed. It has always been on the chopping block for like, like budget negotiations, right? But the NEA is a project that subsidizes the production of art, just as the FHA was a project that subsidized home ownership, and just as we had the Agricultural Adjustment Act of the 1930s that subsidized farming. Right? So this is another subsidy program. Okay? So uh, around this time in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, the government's pouring a lot of money into the NEA. More artists were supported by the NEA at that time than any other time since. Okay? So it was like a good time, relatively, to be an artist. Um, why? Why would the state be interested in subsidizing art in the 1960s? Yeah. Anti-communism. Anti yes. Uh, popular, like popular support because of the war. Right. Popular support because of the war. So the state realizes, and they've realized this for a long time, but become more and more invested in the arts in general. So, uh, <laughs> brief aside. Um, you know, prior to the war, there was a lot of state funding to Hollywood, right, in the golden age, and there was a lot of, like, proletariat and worker sympathy, films coming out to sympathize with our allies, the Russians. That changed, and all those people were then uh, subject to what? All those people that made those films, what happened to them? Not all of them, but a lot of them. Huh? Blacklisted. Right, they were accused of being prematurely anti-fascist is the phrase, so just like sit on that. Like, you're anti-fascist, but too soon. Like, we're actually cool with fascism now. Like, so yeah, so <laughs> the state's really invested in this. Okay, so that's like one path that geographers take is this analysis of how the system of production changed over time, especially with state investment. Now, a lot of other geographers kind of take issue with this. They're not necessarily arguing against it, but they're saying other things, other forms of cultural productions are happening with artists um, that make art desirable. Okay, and make artistic living desirable. So this is mainly coming from the feminist urban geographers like Sharon Zukin, who's really famous. She wrote this book, Loft Living, like about this area that we're in right now. Um, 
And she's saying, look, if you go back to real estate trends, it wasn't necessarily affordable for artists to be living in these lofts, even though they were abandoned after like in a post-industrial landscape. So it goes to show that there was something else kind of going on here and that we should stop thinking of uh, marketization and particularly capitalism and capitalocentrism uh, as the primary way that our lives are structured or determined, okay? So it represents a kind of larger discussion within geography, but it's just mapped onto this urban landscape. What is this obvious picture that I chose that I couldn't think of anything? Warhol, right? Factories, remember that? Who is that? That really bad movie? Factory Girl? Wait, what was it? The one with that woman that slept, like, was with Jude Law. Come on, 2005 people that were <laughs> into that drama. Okay, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Right. Oh, okay. Never mind. No, I realize it's a question that I wrote. So, where do we see an intersection between art, political economy, and urban space? Political economy here meaning uh, capitalism, communism, socialism, right? Those are political economies, they're modes of production versus authoritarianism, fascism, democracy. Those are like forms of government. So, uh, we could just substitute maybe like the market for this, but where do we see basically art? The market, whatever that market is, and urban space intersect. Yeah. Right, so Williamsburg in terms of the advertisements and the murals that are painted. Okay, where else? We could even, no, you're good, we're good. Keep going, back there. I kind of think of like the, the Cobram murals that are in like major cities. Right, exactly. So, ha, exactly. These murals of like really revered public, public figures. Uh, think of Philadelphia. Why is like Philadelphia super relevant in this discussion? Philly, anyone that's been there and knows about Philly? It's like the city of murals. It has the highest amount of murals in any city per capita in the United States. A lot of murals there. A lot of it is like revered things of people, right? Um, okay, if we could scale that up a little bit, um, and think of the intersection, like think of neighborhoods. We were on it with Williamsburg, okay? Think of like particular art neighborhoods, yeah? Yeah, well, look at you just skipping ahead in the lecture. <laughs> okay, skyscrapers. All right, so we're thinking about form, but I'm thinking go to like the example with Villa Madalena in Sao Paulo. Remember I said like, oh, it's like a tourist attraction, um, it's like Instagram famous, all this stuff, yeah. Five points where, yeah. Yeah, where they basically destroyed a, an art center to build a high rise. Mm-hmm, exactly. Five points is an interesting example because it had a kind of cultural capital and not necessarily a strong material capital to it, and then that was yielded, right, to what the city is making like bucks off of is real estate. Right? Okay, yeah. Not a neighborhood, but uh, the train arc, the train repeat that used to exist. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like the opposite spectrum mm -hmm. of the same sponsor art, but with like, um, I guess, Giuliani, uh, like Free Bloomberg era, New York City Queen of, like, that got washed off. Right. Like, the city more appealing to traditional Right. Future property owners, right. So again, part of the larger uh, stop and frisk agenda that's being developed in this time. Thanks, Giuliani. So the other thing that I was thinking about, like I was going super obvious and like Chelsea, right? So we have gallery districts, right? And that's just, I mean, Chelsea is the financial district with a different commodity, okay? It's a material commodity, but it's something that people, <laughs> good, I blow your mind, Evie. Um, but yeah, it's a thing that you invest in that accrues value over time. You can just touch it versus like the monopoly money that's going on down there where they're like doing futures and whatever. Yeah. Oh, really? For who? Exactly. I guess. But like they already have like Trump Tower to look at. They'll be fine. Yeah. So 
this is what I mean, like marketization it creates regions in cities just as industry, other forms of industry create regions and cities, okay? That's all we're doing. All right, so my stellar student up there with the architecture. Okay, so architectures are really like, uh, we did the hard exercise first. Architecture is the more like obvious way that we see art, political economy, and the state um, and urban space intersect, right? So the Burj Khalifa, it's not just existing for utility. It's not like we have so many people here in Dubai and they all need office space, okay? <laughs> it's like not what's happening, right? <laughs> uh, just like look at this thing. So what is being communicated here? Wealth, exactly. And what about that wealth? the most, okay? If we were to get super, like, gender 101 here, yes, <laughs> yes. I'm like, I tell my students, like, it's okay to say it's a big dick. <laughs> it's fine, trust me, like, we've heard it all. Judith Butler already laid it out for us. It's like, okay to say that. So, yeah, Burj Khalifa, we're the biggest, we have the biggest dicks. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> we're like the biggest financial kind of center orienting Dubai and just like the Emirates more generally as a focus, okay? Because the GDP <laughs> here is insane versus the amount of people that are permanent residents. The permanent residents are like 12. I don't know. <laughs> the GDP is like $5 billion. They make their own islands here, <laughs> right? So that's what's being communicated. What is being communicated here? And we can go all different directions. Okay, so we're talking about one world trade. What is being communicated? What is the message I'm sending? Perseverance. Exactly, perseverance. So this is more of a nationalism tie, right? I mean, because there's like three tenants also in one world trade. It's like Condé Nast and the New Yorker. Um, not to knock any of you who work at one world trade. I don't know. Um, think about the way that this looks, though. What is the significance of it being really reflective? What kind of experience does that create for you when you're walking near it? I don't have an answer in my head. I'm just really asking. Yeah. Showing the absence of the towers. Mm. Yeah. Showing absence. Because when you look at it, there are some really gorgeous pictures of One World Trade. Then it just looks like sky. You just see clouds across it. Right. The architectural firm that did One World Trade also did the Burj Khalifa. So they're used to these large-scale projects that communicate these large messages, not only about finance, but about nationhood. Right? Trivia question. How tall is One World Trade? 17, 17. <laughs> so smart. My students are like, I don't know. And I was like, why would I give you like a number that like wouldn't be obvious? <laughs> right. So just to like hit the nail on that head about perseverance, they made sure that spire got those extra few feet. And I don't know if you guys remember when this was going up, but like, like I think it was like Rahm Emanuel over in Chicago, Sarah Lawrence grad. Um, not proud of that one, uh, was like, that doesn't count because the Sears Tower is actually taller. And people were like, how dare you criticize us for our tower when you know that what we've been... It was like very petty tower politics that was happening around 2010. Okay. <laughs> all right. So perfect segue. Visualities and nationalism. All right. So does anyone know this kind of architectural style? <laughs> At all? It's not like a formal architectural style. It's maybe like a political moment. It's not fun. That would have to do with nationalism. Yeah, it's fascist art, right? So I had like a, you know, like typical fascist art, like Albert Speer's kind of building, but it had like Nazi insignia on it. And I was like, that's too obvious. Because fascist art is really embedded in an urban landscape in ways that we don't necessarily associate often incorrectly. We're like, that's Soviet art. And I'm like, it is not. Um, that is fascist architecture. Um, so yeah, this is the Palazzo de Congresi, which was built uh, in a suburb of Rome for the World's Fair that never happened, because um, the World War II happened. <laughs> but, um, so what is being communicated here with this building? What is the message you're getting? Either by the building itself or the overall message of like the place where you're in? Order. Order, right? Yeah. Yeah. Big classicism that references Greek and Roman architecture the empire. Yes. Exactly. They were big on it in fascist Italy about uh, 
the neoclassic uh, classicist idea right we are the next phase of this once fallen empire we are rising again and then order is also deeply deeply important to this and uniformity they were very into populism just because it was like terrible populism it doesn't mean it wasn't a populist message right we we're all coming together um there's this phrase for the stadia that were built in germany and italy at this time referring to the kinds of like <laughs> things they wanted to invoke and they're called something like they wanted to have like public communal experiences or something. <laughs> but like these, the basically, uh, think of all the um, TV shows and like films of that time, but also referencing that time when it's always like thousands of people gathered in a thing, right? And it's to show the strength of the nation here. And it's like one guy and one pillar of light on him or something like this, and everyone doing the same thing. That's not only like meant to communicate the authority of that leader, but it's more so to communicate the homogeneity that they were trying to execute at this time, right? Okay, so again, ideals of the state, ideals of the nation state and nationality are communicated in our landscape, right? Okay, so this is a less obvious, maybe less obvious one. This one I like. <laughs> Um, war memorials are really obvious ways, like nationalism. <laughs> There's not going to be a state-sponsored, D.C.-located war memorial that's critical of like the U.S. military, right? So it's all going to like, operate in a certain logic. But Maya Lin's uh, memorial of the Vietnam War, which she made when she was 23, um, is very different than other war memorials. And what is like one basic way that it's different? For those of you that have maybe been there, back here. Uh, it has all the names of the fallen soldiers. All the names of the fallen soldiers. And then also think of like form here. Why is it? You descend into it. Yes, you descend into it. Everyone here? So as opposed to like something depicting like bravery or someone on a boat or a horse or something, something depicting a person, and also as opposed to something rising from something, super phallic again, which is you know the common tie-in with the nation, we have descending into something. So she's focused on creating experience here. And that experience, as if you've been there, you're descending into it, the wall gets higher around you, overwhelming feeling, right? Replicating a sense of what it's not only like to be in the war, but also to be a person in the States at this time, and like living through this kind of historical period that feels like overflowing, overcoming you, right? So what is the significance here of uh, it being reflective, granite? Yeah. Like seeing your face amongst the names you're mm -hmm. Right, so she really expertly communicates complicity, right? Complicitness, oh, complicitness, right? being complicit um, here. Because when you go up and you want to touch something and you look at a name, you are faced with the reflection of yourself, right? Not only like, what would you do, but what did you do? What did you see? All of these other things. What is the next interesting thing having to do with the names here that makes us a different kind of sculpture? So we have the names of the fallen, but if you've been there and maybe you've seen this, like there's some other kind of interaction happening with these names. Yeah, is that it? Rubbings. So something that you can take with you here. So often people will go and find their loved ones and they'll do graphite etching. So they don't tend to like leave things. Like this is obviously like organized by, I don't know, the monument or park service here. But people will often take the rubbings home. Okay, so that's a very different like decentralized way of engaging with nationalist art here, okay? So, next example, this is where we get to do our callback. Have you seen this before? Where have you seen it if you have? Yes, exactly, in front of Central Park, in front of the plaza in particular. Uh, so, memorials and nationalist art in general are obviously not meant to just reflect things or to communicate strength of the nation, but they're also meant to reiterate existing norms, okay? So a popular reiteration would be gender norms, right? So we have two images of the state here. This is uh, William Sherman's memorial. Anyone like Civil War buff? Anyway, William Sherman was a Union general. 
any of those like ideas or images of like the South on fire is because of him. And they're like, he's such a great war person. He's like burned places. <laughs> so, like the scorch and burn like theory is him. So now we have a cool gold memorial. So we have him on a horse and we have this person in front with what in her hand? This hand, yeah. What does it look like? Huh? Palm, which is kind of a cousin of something. An olive branch. It's palms, olive branches, laurels, all meant to communicate both peace and victory. Because, uh, okay, hearkening back to my first year of Latin, okay, <laughs> laurel comes from the root laudare, which is how we get loud, or louded, like Lauren. Same root. Um, so we have two images of this nation state here, right? So we have the feminized one where we think of motherland, okay? And motherland is a thing worth protecting. It is the comforts of your home, right? It is so intimately tied with our understandings of domestic space, which we consider women's sphere still. They, have, they are the managers of that space. And then we have fatherland, the thing that protects motherland, the thing that marches forward, right? So this person is, or this, not person, it's not really her, okay. So model for this is Audrey Munson, whose face is all over the city. She's in the Beaux-Arts movement, and she's probably one of the most replicated women in that movement to date. So that first image that I showed you was another Audrey Munson one outside of the Brooklyn Museum. And it's, there are two of them. So there's one on one side that I showed, and that is the allegorical representation of Brooklyn, which is full of books. She has like books, and it's cute, and like a little kid wanting to read a book. No idea why they thought that would be related. Um, and then on the other side of the museum entrance, you have the allegorical representation of Manhattan, and it's just like, like bows and arrows and arms and shit. So you have those two, they used to actually be at the base of the Manhattan Bridge, and they moved them over in the 1960s. So that is your fun art trivia. Cute. Okay, so now we're getting to public memory. All right, I have no idea where I am on time, guys. So Karen Till talks about public art as a form of public memory, and we can think of no better uh, representation of this than the debate surrounding removing monuments. This I took very careful care to represent because it is not a Confederate soldier or anyone general. This is from Central Park. I don't know if anyone's familiar. This is J. Marion Sims. Anyone know who J. Marion Sims is? Really? Who's J? <laughs> Go on. Uh huh. What? He's a gynecologist, the father of modern gynecology. Look at you. Okay, J. Marion Sims, father of modern gynecology. The things that he founded like still have not, like some of the shit like has not evolved since then, which is crazy. Uh, yeah, but what is he renowned for? experimenting on black women, on slaves. The theory being black women don't experience pain anyway, so like this is just a fun like learning time, right? Many of them died. So, J. Marion Sins being removed. And a lot of the discussion or the concern around removing monuments was, well, what, like no one, how are people gonna learn about all of these things? How are they going to learn about history and all these things. So quick experiment. Raise your hand if you've heard of the Civil War. <laughs> Hi, be proud. Raise your hand. Wah! <laughs> Keep them up. Raise your hand if you've heard of the Civil War purely because you saw a statue about it. Just one, <laughs> really? OK, I'm interested. OK. So it's not like. When I had this conversation with my students, they were like very concerned about removing them. They're like, we just need all statues to exist. All statues are great. Like, we shouldn't remove anything. And that's fine, fine, fine. But th what I find interesting about these conversations is that they're more talking about our anxiety of the connection between history and space. We somehow believe that, it, or some of us, that removing these things somehow removes a public memory. Right? Even though the way that we encountered the things was not through that to begin with at all. Even though the conditions under which those statues are produced were not about remembrance at all. For some of you might know this. So uh, what year does the Civil War end? 
1865. What there are a few uh, decades long um, building episodes of these statues. So can anyone think of one? Like, give a decade. Exactly, 1910s. Anyone think of another one? 1960s. And there's a kind of a two other like trick ones we'll talk about. But anyway, 1910s is the first one. So 1910s were coming out of the reconstruction and the second reconstruction um, where we had some of the highest electoral representation of black Americans in the US history still. Um, we have the reemergence of the KKK. KKK is pretty old. Reemergence of the KKK. And then we have the DAR, Daughters of the American Revolution, uh, really invested in building these statues, okay? So what we haven't so much discussed <laughs> is what kinds of spaces do we find these in, or were they built in, around the 1910s then pretty consistent in the 1960s as well. Are they, like, are they in front of libraries? Are they in parks? Like, where, where do we see these? Public parks, squares. We could even be like, what kind of parks and what kind of squares? And Political areas, we see them outside of courthouses. A lot is one. There's another one. So they're in public parks and they're in public squares, but the where of that is really critical. These are in white neighborhoods. They're talking about this history all the time. These are in black neighborhoods, right? Or what were black areas in the 1910s. Remember, we are going into Jim Crow here. So these are in like really <laughs> segregated areas around this time. So that is common in the 1910s, the 1940s, kind of in advance of the uh, civil rights movement and then into the 1960s. Then it dies down and the next peak we have is in the 1980s. But it is very different because they're like, all right, it's not chill to make uh, statues anymore, all right? We, we can't make more. So what are we gonna do in like black public space that references the Confederacy that isn't a statue. So we're changing kind of form here, changing medium. Hmm? Flag closer, not quite. Change in form. We said flags, not flags. Not what I'm thinking of. What? Plaques? Closer, warmer. Names of areas. So a lot of historically black high schools are named like Robert E. Lee High, right? So it changes form, right? So racism's always there, uh, but it just changes in form, okay? So they're like, okay, not chill to make statues anymore, okay? So we're going to rename things here. And eh, now we're good. Never mind. So, point being, selective histories, the fear that somehow public memory of an event is going to be erased, whereas for some of us, we never forgot. Um, and this, like, just really deep tie to a history that is kind of a false history as well. So that's why there were some of those articles that came out about, like, hey, actually, these things are mass produced, and you can, like, pull them down really easily and dent them. Like, really, yeah, they're not, like, there's no, like, a sympathetic, you know, Confederate Remembrance Agency of Michelangelo's making these, like, sweat on their brow. That's not how that's happening. So, the next one, in terms of public memory that is up for debate. Has anyone seen these before around the city by Alexander Bell? So there was one in uh, my neighborhood in central Brooklyn for a while. Alexander Bell was a journalist first by training. And she, as a journalist and a black journalist, was really frustrated with the way that black people and victims of police brutality and basically state-sanctioned executions uh, were being represented, right? So I don't know if you guys remember around the time that Mike Brown was executed that the New York Times ran that article that was like, he was no angel, um, as if like that's a reason for the state to kill you. So. Seeing those kind of articles, she uses this really great method that the state actually uses if anyone wants to like do a FOIA request or request your own FBI file and find all those redactions, right? So she uses that same method to eliminate these superfluous kind of details of these articles, right? So for instance, the title says originally like two lives at a crossroads in Ferguson and she just makes it crossroads in Ferguson. Right? I can't remember what this word is, but this is the Darren Wilson, the officer that executed Michael Brown, uh, his profile. They did this really inelegant thing of like just putting them side by side as if they were just like, 
I don't know, there's some kind of Shakespearean interaction here. Um, so it just says like a profile officer. Um, the Mike Brown one said, a teenager grappling with problems and promise. And so she changed that to a teenager with promise and then changed the A1 cover of the New York Times to just that, using the photo of his graduation photo instead of the ones that were being passed around online. So in these redactions, we actually see how long it takes for our eye to get to the reason why we're reading about that person in the first place. So it takes us to the end of the third paragraph to get to fatally shot an unarmed black teenager named Michael Brown. Yet his name is introduced all the way up here. So I don't know what I'm learning here. I'm learning about his career. I'm learning about his family. I'm learning about like, how he was traumatized. Remember that bullshit. So I'm learning about that. Then we have Michael Brown, beginning of the third paragraph, his shooting death by Darren Wilson, a white police officer. So it takes that long, right? And it's a really interesting kind of exercise because all this other information almost doesn't matter. The point was, we had a kid that was shot with a state-sanctioned, you know, killing of him. State-sanctioned meaning that it's not like the state told this person to shoot this person, but is exonerated from that crime, right? Next, this is my fun. Do you remember this one in 2014? Are any of you a Brooklynites around Fort Greene at this time? So this is Buckwild, 24 hours at the Parks Department. So overnight, there was, first of all, there was an empty plinth already at like, I think the south side of Fort Greene Park, which you're just inviting trouble. And an artist put a bust of this person. Anyone recognize him? Snowden, right? So the NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden put a bust, like a bronze bust of him on it, right? And then all these people are, like taking pictures and tweeting about it. And this is like really fast, right? Because it's still morning. I remember this. Parks Department comes and they like really sloppily put this um, like just trash bag over it. So like to shield your eyes, right? And then they're like, I don't know how we take it down. But people are still standing around it. So they're like waiting for them to go so they can like remove it. So no one gets a picture of that. It gets removed. And then later that night, someone did a, like, what are those things? Like, I just said, like, light art projection of his face over it. It was really cool. Yeah, so Karen Till references this in some way by saying, what pasts are to be remembered by whom, where, and in what form? That is the point of talking about visualities and places of memory to begin with, right? And that's what we're talking about with selective histories, okay? And it's attempts to make it coherent, but by virtue of being public, it is immediately incoherent. So she says they actually like don't do this well, right? But what past? So we can't remember the past that of Edward Snowden, who's like chilling out in Russia now. We can't remember the secrets that he exposed. Like that would not be good, right? We should remember the past of J. Marion Sims or Robert E. Lee, these people that were literally separatists. Like, even if you're like the most like nationalist I love America person, like they didn't want to be here, like part of it, you know, so it's like weird. Okay. So what am I getting at? Where does this go? Ah, so we have two kind of forms of visualities here, critical visualities and resistant visualities. Okay. So critical visuality is what we've kind of been doing you and I, expose the limits of images. What do they exclude? All right, so we've talked about like what isn't here? What am I getting from this? What is it communicating? But what are the absences here? What are the gaps? A resistant visuality then places those exclusions at the center of our analysis. So it's not enough to say, well, this isn't here, so fuck that piece of art. You know, <laughs> it's more like this isn't here, and by virtue of it not being here and not being in public space, what is the larger intention of that absence? All right. So one ex example that I like to end on is the District 6 Museum in Cape Town. Has anyone ever been here before or heard about it? So District 6 was a black community in Cape Town that was raised and forcibly removed in built up for white people. White people took their homes, or white South Africans took their homes, all, this, all of these land grabs that we're familiar with in apartheid. So there are plenty of ways that the apartheid era is remembered that are in the forms of critical visualities, right? Like what is excluded, what isn't here, et cetera. What is interesting about the District 6 Museum is that it's really small. It's in an old church. And these little side areas here are all things that used to be in District 6 in people's homes. So you can walk into these little spaces and just see the mundanity and how people lived. 
okay? So you also have people, because remember apartheid, not long ago, you also have people there that run the museum and whose things are there that just talk about life. Because often when we hear about oppression or exclusions or all of these things, that's the only moment we're talking about. And we talk about the tragedy of what is lost, but we don't just talk about the basic humanity of people that live there, which is really the emphasis of the museum. It's like, no, we just hung out. We had families. We still have families, right? Here, as a floor length kind of map of what District 6 was and whose lots were where and all this other stuff. And District 6 is very much in Cape Town and in South Africa, too. It just looks like another white neighborhood, right? anyone that's seen that District 9 movie. Do you guys remember that movie? Like, sorry, it was about the, like, it was like a way to make apartheid like contemporary by talking about aliens and robots. It was very odd. Anyway, that's my lecture. <laughs> <laughs>
yeah, I'm happy to talk more like in person about those afterwards, but there's a lot of cool stuff happening in New York City around that. Thank you, Evie. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Yes, back there, friend. Is this like not working? Is it just me? I keep thinking my voice is soft. I know I'm loud, but like, go on, sorry. You're doing great. Thank you. Um, I feel like there was a lot of examples of how like institutions use geography to kind of like shape the idea of what that sculpture or art is going to represent in that community, right? Is there, do you have any examples of like positive things where like the community has put art in their geography to like embody them or like to say something that like is actually wanted to be said in that community? Mm. If that makes sense? Yeah. Um, happy stories of geography. So I live in the sad place of geography constantly. That's like actually where most geographers are is we're like, we're just talking about state oppression 24 seven. Um, well, you know, contrary to like the actual subject, I think works like Al Alexandra Bell's work, those wheat pastes are an example of that, right? Because no, Michael Brown was not part of central Brooklyn, right? But his experience is not that different from central Brooklynites, right? And I find that the w versions of that aren't necessarily going to be on the scale, like the large scale or on the longer time scale of that. They tend to be pretty ephemeral. Um, that may be a generalization, but my experience uh, is that they tend to be pretty ephemeral and they tend to be um, intentionally exclusive, right? Because they are community-based. If I think about the certain kinds of murals that exist in my neighborhood, they're both like memorializing people that were from there, right? But there are also other fun things. Like there are a lot of like positive education murals <laughs> where I live that's like stay in school and all this kind of stuff. So it's, no, is it a critical or resistant visuality? Not necessarily, but it's not something that's also being like cracked down by the state either. And it is something that is raised by the community, but just because it is, doesn't necessarily mean that it is some kind of democratic process either. We tend to assume that public art is by default more democratic because it's in the space of the people, but that's not necessarily true. The other way that I find that is more in terms of having long-term art spaces. So we have like a lot of community-run theaters where I live as well, and I think of that as an example too. So it's not something like managed by the state, right? But it is something that is like a theater group that specializes in like Africana theater and talks about the diaspora and all these other kinds of, I find that they happen in other kinds of institutions as well. Does that feel convincing? No, I think that's great. I guess my follow-up would be, do you think creating statues or these like long-lasting things that we like, now want to like, take down for the right reasons or whatever, like putting up statues of positive influences or like taking ownership of those spaces that weren't necessarily given to the people and like putting in people or ideas or art that is lasting and maybe less ephemeral, like you said, like a statue of something that you'd want to stay there in that community for 100 years or however long that statue's been in Central Park. You know what I mean? Like, do I think that it's good or do, what do I think about it? Like, should it happen or is it happening? Should there be a movement to like replace statues that were put there for negative reasons mm. with statues with positive influence, I guess. So here's a, like, that's an interesting question. And I'm just saying that as like a way to segue, like, mm -hmm, but it is. Because a lot of geographers have had this discussion prior to this. There's a really great famous geographer, Catherine McKittrick, right? And she writes all about, like, she's not, she's like super theoretical and awesome and a fucking genius. Uh, so, we're kind of, I was kind of admittedly being a little bit flattening with that discussion because the statue doesn't necessarily represent the person or even the uh, politics of the state at that time, but also like public opinion, right? So one argument that is still like from the left of center is to leave those statues up because taking them down is a false representation of like coherence and peace that doesn't exist. Like it's like a lie, right? So 
McKittrick, I believe, and this is like in a, tw- a genius tweet of hers, so like don't go looking for this paper, right? But, um, but citation politics are really cool now, and you can't. So she has like expressed that the taking down presents a false, another kind of false coherence of urban space where we are all fine. So we take down the statues, right? But that presents... Ah, this is what I was looking for. Uh, dumbass, like, post-racialism. Okay? Right? Like, we've moved beyond that. Now we have a Frederick Douglass statue. You know, that also might not be directly relevant to my experience now. Um, so it's something that I've been marinating on for a while. I know that my I just, like, don't want to look at racists anymore when I leave my house, and, like, that's as far as I go. But I, f- I find that argument really interesting and, like, a, a just really fruitful and generative you know so I don't think it's a I don't think it's one size and however it's executed won't be one size anyway because we're eight million people here um and I don't think that removing them makes uh, removes racism but also that's not the goal of necessarily removing them either it's to create a different kind of urban experience but for instance removing them doesn't change um doesn't change NYPD policing Right? It doesn't also change a thing that affects me, right? And a no, nor does it cultivate a warm feeling of being in New York City, a more warmer feeling. Maybe, maybe it will, but I think that's the point where geographers like McKittrick are coming from. So I don't know, good? All right, God. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye.